pretty much introduced myself in the different areas of my specialization. I've written books, many articles dealing with all these issues. And <clears throat> my presentation is going to be um, Morocco is a breakthrough in peace relations with Israel. Start, I will start with a question. Why has Morocco been so active in trying to promote peace, not only throughout the Arabic speaking world, but in the, specifically in the Middle East? And that is a very loaded question that, that will uh, accompany my uh, presentation uh, throughout. I would say this. Morocco is very concerned about, was very concerned, especially in the 1970s, about the radicalization of Arab regimes and uh, the fact that the Soviet Union at the time was still very much present in several countries within the region. As far as uh, King Hassan II, then the King of Morocco, this was a danger for the stability of the whole region uh, both sides of the Mediterranean and everywhere else in the uh, Arabic speaking world. So it was in his interest uh, to bring about, to encourage stability. And he's been quite courageous about that, I might say. Uh, the other, that's as far as the Arab world is concerned. Why Israel? Because as far as he was concerned, Morocco had a long standing relations with Israel through back channels never direct, always clandestine, secret, but Israel and Morocco go together ever since Morocco gained its independence in March 1956 from uh, the French and the Spanish, when the two French and Spanish protectorates came to an end. Uh, at the time, there were very tense ties with Morocco. I will not elaborate on that uh, very uh, uh, at length. Simply say, that Morocco was one country that for a long time, between 1956 and 1961, would not let its Jewish communities leave for Israel. They actually banned immigration. And the only way to Jews to come out is through an underground. So Israel was already then having formed an underground under the auspices of the Mossad, uh, the Mossad for Special Operations, and the uh, immigration department of the Jewish agency. The Mossad and the Jewish agencies uh, collaborated in order to form this underground uh, rail, if you wish. It was, uh, it was by land, by sea, okay? It was even by air with fake passports and everything else. It was very difficult to do so, but Israel did so through this organization called Hamiz Garrett, or framework in English, uh, which again, I'm not going to talk much about it, and again, just say that this, or, this uh, particular organization had its emissaries, Mossad emissaries. They were not all Mossadniks that were raised in Mossad, but they were recruited uh, to the Mossad in order to uh, penetrate Morocco and get the Jews out. And this was going on for about five years with a lot of tragedies, including one boat that was shot at uh, in 1960 in what was called Operation Fish. Uh, and there were no casualties, but the people were arrested when the police opened fire on them uh, in the, near the area of Tetuan in Northern Morocco. They were heading towards Ceuta, from which place they were going to go to Gibraltar, and then from Gibraltar to the uh, Jewish agency transition camp in Marseille on their way to Israel. The other was the boat called Pisces or uh, Agoz, which foundered in the Mediterranean in January, 1961, and uh, 44 people died. Uh, so Israel had its people from the Mossad or people recruited by the Mossad in order to uh, get the Jews out, but they were not dealing in security issues. They did not have any connections with the Moroccan intelligence service. They considered the Moroccan intelligence service as an enemy. 
But Israel at the time decided that Morocco is a young nation together with Tunisia. With Tunisia, it didn't work out. Bourguiba, there were contacts with Bourguiba, uh, President Bourguiba of Tunisia all the time, but he really, uh, nothing came out of it. With Morocco, the Israelis spinned a lot of hopes in, who, in what was then the crown prince of Morocco. The king was Mohammed V, uh, Mohammed ben Yusuf. Uh, his son was uh, Mulay, uh, Mulay, um, uh, Mulay uh, Hassan. Uh, and uh, they saw a day when uh, Hassan, who later became Hassan II, would be a person they could work with. They couldn't do it with his father. Mohammed V was too conservative. Uh, he was too tied to the um, Arab League. He joined the Arab League in October of 1958. He was against what he called his Jewish children leaving the country. They he didn't think that that was uh, the right thing to do. And therefore, uh, there wasn't much to deal with him in any way. But he passed away uh, in February of 1961. A month later, Crown Prince Mulay Hassan became King Hassan II. King Hassan II was a man who received a Western education and um, he owes Israel a lot. This brings me back to that original question. He owes Israel a great deal. In 1959, at the end of 1959, uh, the Mossad provided information to the Moroccan security services. It was passed on through channels, warning that the opposition in Morocco that was led by people that were connected with the opposition leader, Mehdi Ben Barka, the, uh, his, some of his friends who had formed a new political party called the UNFP, Union Nationale de Force Populaire, in English, popular, uh, popular, uh, National Union of the Popular Forces, uh, that they were uh, seeking to uh, perhaps overthrow the, the monarchy in Morocco. And they had plans to assassinate, uh, who was still then in 1959, the Crown Prince Hassan. Uh, the information included data about Egypt being involved in this, that the Nasser regime was somehow also in collaboration, or you might use the word in collusion with what was going on. Uh, these people were arrested, and eventually um, this was a modest beginning in the ties between Israel and Morocco. The... Um, the second time, but Israel did two things. Israel was also involved in contacting the opposition to the monarchy, because it was said the monarchy may not survive. We may as well also make some inroads with the opposition. Uh, after the story I told you what happened in 1959, Mehdi Ben Barka, the leader of the opposition, went into voluntary exile. And he was looking for himself for ways to contact Israel. And uh, a meeting was arranged. I won't get into details who arranged it and everything, but it was certainly an, it certainly involved the Mossad a Mossad uh, operative meeting with him. Uh, that Mossad operative was uh, Israel's right hand man. That was the Mossad's second head in the history of the Mossad, and uh, they met in um, um, they met they met in Paris when. Ben Barka was in exile, and Ben Barka, among other, thing, other things, asked if Israel could provide him with weapons in order to overthrow the monarchy in Morocco, in case the monarchy will not tone down the hostility of Prince, Crown Prince Hassan and will not transform into a constitutional monarchy. In other words, if they continue to be a feudal monarchy, then there will be no choice because I, Ben Barka, am willing to uh, tolerate the monarchy if it's a constitutional monarchy, a more symbolic monarchy in many ways, with me as being the prime minister of Morocco. Not president, prime minister. Um, but if the, uh, the, mon the, the monarchy will act in a stubborn fashion, then we may have to use arms. Will Israel provide us with arms? The man that I that met him 
uh, who was close to uh, Israel. His name was Yaakov Karoz. Yaakov Karoz wrote everything down. Uh, he said, I will go back to Israel. I will discuss these issues. Now, of course, Ben Barker didn't know it was the Mossad. Uh, the person who introduced Karoz to Ben Barker said, he works in the prime minister's office. Well, of course, uh, anybody works, uh, that works in the prime minister's office, usually, and if it's someone that deals with intelligence, it is the, the head of Mossad. So Israel was in touch uh, with also the opposition, but it came to the conclusion the people to work it, to work with are the, uh, the 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 king of Morocco and the crown prince. So um, when Hassan became a king, he remembered what Israel had had done for him. By the way, the information that uh, uh, Ben Barka relayed to uh, Karoz was passed on, of course, to Moroccan intelligence as well. So they knew that Ben Barka was considering scheming all kinds of things against the monarchy. So again, uh, the king, the new king in 1961 owed a great deal to, uh, to Israel. And after that, he also opened the gates for immigration for Jews to Israel. I won't get into that, but, uh, but at the same time, relations were forged between Israel and the, um, and the Moroccan intelligence, as well as with the palace, as well as with the king, for special relations that led, after a few years, to an opening of a Mossad station in Rabat. Since then, and even to this very day, there is a Mossad station in Rabat. It's not as active as it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, but there is still a representation, a representation uh, and a delegation of the Mossad in, uh, in Morocco. The other reason that uh, Hassan was, you might say, pro-Israel, although he had his disagreements with Israel, was because he liked Jews. He really did. Of all Arab leaders that I can think of, uh, he had very close relations with Jews. Some of the women who took care of him uh, when he was a child in the palace were Jewish. Um, um, his business partners, including some of the leading people among in Moroccan Jewry, like um, uh, David Amar, who was the head of the, uh, um, the Council of Jewish uh, Communities of Morocco, uh, um, um, Sami, ben uh, Sami Benazaraf, uh, people from the Berdugo family from Meknes, a very distinguished family of rabbis, but also of businessmen. They were, some, they were some of his business partners. So he always had an affinity uh, for Jews. He had great admiration for Israel, the way Israel be, uh, engaged in nation building in the first decade of its existence. Uh, and he saw Israel, and he also, uh, he regarded the uh, Israeli policy of what was known as the um, uh, periphery doctrine, whereby Israel forged ties with the Shah of Iran and with the government in Turkey and with Ethiopia against Soviet expansionism, against Nasser, the president Nasser of Egypt, all, be, all sorts of people who were trying to undermine and destabilize uh, the region. So he felt that Morocco could be also, wouldn't say an integral part, but it could be an adjunct to the periphery doctrine. It wasn't quite as important as Iran and Turkey. Uh, uh, the relations with Iran and Turkey and Israel eventually became transparent with embassies, not just uh, behind the scene back channel activity. So, um, uh, but still he felt that he could benefit from Israel. He also had a lot of respect for American Jewry. They have a lot of influence. They will help him. Uh, they will, uh, he, he may be able to get weapons from the United States, get more uh, uh, fine, uh, economic aid from the United States. So Israel was important to him also in that sense. Israel, by the way, helped him uh, with, the, with the Polisario, what Moshe mentioned uh, earlier about the war in the Western Sahara. Israel helped him uh, with that as well. So the combination of things, his concern about the region, about instability in the Arab world, about the radicalization of the Palestinian organizations, and the fact that Israel 
uh, is a force to contend with, with. He said a long time ago, quietly, of course, Israel is a reality. He told that face to face to Alex Easterman, who was the uh, director of the World Jewish Congress office in London, that Israel is a reality. In fact, he's probably the only Arab leader who went as far as to argue two things. One, that Israel should join the uh, should join the Arab League, which is of course nonsensical. That's not a, it's a it's a contradiction in itself. Um, but the other thing that um, that uh, that Israel should um, um, uh, that that Israel should if it has to retreat from the 1967 lines for, uh, after the Six Day War, it should retreat to the uh, armistice line agreements of 1949. In other words, he didn't talk about the partition of Palestine according to UN Resolution 141 into an Arab-Palestinian state and a Jewish state. He didn't talk about that. He said that the so-called borders that Israel had since 1949 that negotiated between, between February and July of 1949, the armistice line, what we call the Kava Yarok, that should be recognized by the Arab world, which nobody in the Arab world, including Bourguiba of Tunisia, were willing to tolerate. So that brings me now to the major uh, presentation. There were Moroccan uh, Israeli ties that continued to forge ahead to develop um, into the 1960s. Uh, the Mossad provide a, engage in, uh, um, um, intelligence information sharing with uh, Morocco. Morocco provided recordings of the many Arab summit conferences. Morocco, I think, broke every record of the Arab summits. Most Arab summits were held in Morocco, some in Algeria, some in Egypt. Uh, most of them were held in Morocco, either in Rabat uh, or uh, Marrakesh or in Casablanca. And uh, Hassan, would provide Israel recording, for instance, there was a famous uh, Arab summit in uh, 1965 when they were discussing the formation of the PLA, the Palestine Liberation Army, that was really never an integral part of the Palestine Liberation Organization, but it was the Palestine Liberation Air Army that was in many ways subordinate to the Syrian, various successive Syrian regimes. All these recordings were provided to the Mossad. Um, we supplied them with weapons. Some of our old weapons we bought from the French when we had a, a honeymoon with the French before we became came closer to the United States. Uh, and um, these were, uh, um, uh, we sold it. How did we transfer it to him? We did it through the Shah of Iran. It went to Iran and from Iran and went to, uh, 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 to, to Morocco. So those were the happy days when the Shah of Iran was still there. I would say in many ways that Hassan II, who by the way, was a very brutal person. He was very brutal against his opposition. He had concentration camps in Tazmamat, which is a, in the Sahara. He, he, he expected total loyalty from everybody. And the minute he suspected there was a problem, uh, he would do something very, very uh, negative about it. I go, I move ahead to, um, after a time when there were some strained relations with Morocco in the early 70s, when Hassan sent uh, military troops to the Golan Heights to fight us uh, on the Syrian front. And later on, he opposed the, he opposed the disengagement agreement uh, between Israel and, and uh, Egypt that was brokered by uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Uh, he then moder moderated his view in 1975 when there was a second disengagement agreement between Israel and Egypt. Why? Because in between those two agreements, Israel finally signed in May of 1974, a disengagement agreement with Hafez al-Assad, with Syria. And he admired Hafez al-Assad. We will see. Hassan didn't like Sadat very much. He considered him a weakling. He really preferred, uh, he said, the great leader of the Arab world today is Assad. But we, we can say uh, with utmost confidence that of all the Arab leaders, 
those, this particular king in a more remote part of the Arab world was probably the most stable, the most serious, and the most respected by everyone, including some of the radical Arab regimes like Gaddafi's Libya, like Iraq under the Ba'ath since 1968, uh, Syria as well, even Egypt, although I don't know how much, I don't know how much uh, Sadat, after he succeeded Nasser, how much he, how, that he knew, how low of an opinion uh, um, uh, uh, Hassan is of him. So anyway, in, after 1975, the relations in Morocco and Israel improved. And um, at that time in Israel, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in October 1976 inquired if Morocco could engage in quiet diplomacy to help invigorate the process that had commenced with the two Egyptian Israeli Sinai agreements. Rabin arrived in Rabat disguised with a blonde hairpiece. Though, noting, uh, though, noting, uh, though nothing uh, uh, tangible came from this initiative, the contents of Rabin's, Rabin's deliberations with Hassan disclosed to the, to the journalist Dan Patir by Rabin shortly before Rabin's assassination are noteworthy. Based on Rabin's own accounts, Hassan volunteered to play an important role in the Middle East because he feared that the lingering conflict, the radicalization of the Palestinians and the persistent Arab dependence on the Soviet Union directly threatened Arab pro-Western and monarchical regimes, including his own. Hassan's central thesis was that it would be preferable to enter into direct Arab-Israeli dialogue without a mediator because he said, Every mediator suffers from self-interest and brings his own negotiating table. As far as Hassan was concerned, the United States should be the last, we will see that he contradicted himself, the United States should be the last to serve in that capacity. Hassan, according to Rabin, wanted to obtain clarifications from Israel as to the conditions it might pose insofar as resolving the Palestinian problem. Most interesting, however, was the king's encouragement for Israel to negotiate first and foremost with the Syrians. Hassan confided in Rabin that he considered Anwar Sadat a weak leader. In Hassan's estimation, Syria's Hafez al-Assad enjoyed growing prominence in the Arab world, where Sadat's image was in decline and his credibility was being seriously questioned. Because Assad stood out as one of the more tough leaders of the Arab world, it behooved Israel, according to Hassan, to commence negotiations with him, settling territorial and other disputes with the tougher leader first, with the Syrians, then the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, would leave the easier problem of Egypt and the rest, of, and the, and the rest to the end. Dismayed by this line of reasoning, Rabin was skeptical of its realization. Nonetheless, he urged Hassan to strive toward creating a channel for Syrian-Israeli contacts. The king promised to help, but requested a letter outlining the scope of Israel's territorial concessions, to which Rabin complied, complied excuse me. Uh, nothing materialized, however. The breakthrough would occur in the latter half of 1977, but not during Rabin's tenure as prime minister. The Israeli election of May 17, 1977, replaced the Rabin government with a conservative Likud coalition led by longtime opposition leader Menachem Begin. In summer 1977, King Hassan, like Romanian President Nikolai Ceausescu, agreed to mediate between the Egyptians and the Israelis as a first step toward a political settlement. There were clear indications that Begin, despite the seemingly uncompromising uh, stance on over territorial concessions, was prepared to undertake a peace initiative. For Begin, relinquishing parts of the Sinai was less uh, uh, crucial and painful than withdrawing from the West Bank or the Gaza Strip, as the Sinai did not figure into a Zionist concept 
of greater Israel. On the other hand, he had serious concerns and reservations about the Carter administration's insistence on convening a peace conference in Geneva to launch a comprehensive Middle East peace uh, agreement. Israel consistently shunned efforts to be dragged into a forum where the Soviets and the Arabs, along with the Americans, might seek to force major territorial and political concessions that would be unacceptable to it. Sadat too, at the time, looked for alternatives to the American initiative, especially given Syrian stubbornness on major issues, but also even on procedural arrangements over the conference's format and makeup. Yet without abandoning, Sadat, without abandoning completely the Geneva option. Already in summer 1977, Sadat had become disillusioned over the stalemate in the region since 1975. He appeared ready to probe external mediation channels in order to enter into direct negotiations with Israel. Direct negotiation. Till this point, Sadat would not consider direct negotiations with Israel. Now I have to, I have to go on. This is, yeah. Uh, on, okay, uh, on July, on, 20, on July 27, 1977, Itzhak Khofi, head of the Mossad, entered Prime Minister Begin's office and provided him with a cable from Sadat that had arrived through Morocco. Sadat's message, message disclosed complete readiness to reach a peace settlement with Israel. Khofi told Begin that Hassan was embarking on a course for the purpose to bring the parties together in Morocco for the preliminary meetings of clarifications and assessment. Begin approved Hafi's pursuance of the offer. The person whom Sadat nominated to represent him in Morocco was his advisor and the deputy prime premier Hassan al-Tohami. Hafi and Tohami met at the beginning of August 1977 in Ifran at the Royal Summer Retreat to lay the groundwork for the future high level Egyptian Israeli meeting which would be concluded in the presence of the king. Upon Hassan's invitation, Israeli Foreign Minister Moshe Dayan arrived in Ifran on September the 4th, 1977, accompanied by Khofi. The two men met King Hassan the next day in the presence of Moroccan Prime Minister Ahmed Osman, the Palace Court Minister General Abdel Latif Alawi, and Colonel Ahmed Dlimi, the main contact person between the Mossad and the Moroccan security services. Dayan, like Rabin before him, told Hassan that the key to peace lay in the hands of Sadat and not Assad. At the same time, Dayan said Israel needed to reach gradual and separate, separate peace accords with each of its Arab neighbors, but not part and parcel of a comprehensive settlement immediately or in the foreseeable future. He then uh, formally asked the king to arrange an Israeli-Egyptian meeting on the highest official level as possible, to which Hassan reacted affirmatively and dispatched Foreign Minister Ahmad Laraki, who knew about the contacts, to Cairo to work out the details. On September 6, Dayan returned to Israel and updated, updated Begin about his discussions with Hassan. None of the Israeli government ministers, save Begin, of course, knew of what was brewing on the back burner. Excepting for the aforementioned officials, the Moroccan cabinet ministers were equally in the dark in Morocco. On, 7th, on September 7th, Morocco's foreign minister, Laraki, arrived in Cairo with a letter from Hassan to Sadat, indicating the Israelis were eager to enter into high level discussions with Egyptian counterparts. On September the 9th, Morocco signaled to Israel that the Egyptian wished to meet with a senior Israeli official. One week later, on September the 16th, Dayan and Tuhami <coughs> Rabat for discussions under the auspices of Hassan, serving as moderator slash facilitator. Also present at, in the meeting was Prime Minister Ahmed Osman, Foreign Minister Ahmed Laraki, the, who was the minister of the court, General Abdel Latif Alawi, and, and that's cute, I like that, and Joseph. Well, Joseph, yes, Joseph. Who was Joseph? He wasn't Joseph. He wasn't even Yosef. He wasn't even Yusuf. 
That was Ahmad Limi, the head of the security services and the top man in the relations between Mossad with Israel actually, and Mossad at, and the security secret services. Hassan opened the meeting cautioning against lack of discretion on the Egyptians, uh, discretion. On the Egyptian side, the preliminary Egyptian-Israeli contacts under the aegis of the palace were known in Egypt only to Sadat, Vice President Hosni Mubarak, <coughs> and of course, Tohami. In Israel, only Khofi, Dayan, and Begin. The king claimed that the Americans had no knowledge of the meeting, although in due course, if the parties arrived at an understanding, Washington would be brought into the picture. Now he's saying all the contradiction. He said, Americans should be the last to be involved in any negotiations, in any mediation. But then he says in the king's words, I quote him from the Mossad document. I quote, the Americans should, now, should not know of these contacts, but if we really come to an understanding, then it should be made out as if our agreement was the Americans' initiative. And then it should be handled as an American peace effort, as a faith saving operation, end quote. The king then suggested the two parties commence by discussing Israel's withdrawal from all occupied territories kept <coughs> during the war, including the Golan Heights, after which time other issues would be easier to discuss and reach understandings. Hassan said confidently that Assad will also join the peace process once Sadat reached an agreement with Israel. Mohammed concurred with Hassan and highlighted the issue of territories as the chief, chief obstacle to peace. The Palestinians, he said, I quote, were worthy of nationhood. He didn't use the word state, he said nationhood. With such, a rec such recognition, their radicalism toward Israel and the Arab regime would continue to gain, st uh, gain strength. He referred to the Palestine enclave on the east, okay, whatever that means really, uh, could be in association with Jordan, while Egypt and Saudi Arabia together could supervise the Palestinians. Yet the latter must have a national entity, the Palestinians. Beyond that, Egypt would assent to Israel's demands for international guarantees of the United Nations, the United States, and as much as he, uh, they hated the Soviet Union, the Egyptians like the Moroccans, also the Soviet Union. Once the Egyptian-Israeli channels produce results, the likelihood that Assad and Jordan's King Hussein could join the talks. This should not be dismissed, he said. In any case, Sadat will not agree, says Tohami, to a separate peace treaty with Israel. Syria and Jordan must come into the fold. Finally, there has to be a solution regarding Jerusalem, which is also a holy city for Muslims and a sensitive issue with all Arab states. It had to end with a comprehensive agreement, even if not all at once and in several phases. It was clear to Tuhami that first it should be the Egypt. Egypt. He was an Egypt first advocate. Uh, in order to also make progress uh, over peace, yet without leaving out the Syrians and Jordanians. No mention was made in the Palestine Liberation or Organization. I looked to all the documents of the Mossad and I couldn't find the word Palestine Liberation Organization. It wasn't there at all. Tuhami added, Sadat wants to progress as quickly as possible with the major issues before the convening of the Geneva Convention. He didn't want to go to the Geneva Convention. Further, Tuhami told Dayan that he thought full official diplomatic relations, ties between Israel and Egypt should be achieved only gradually over a period ranging from three to five years to which Hassan quipped angrily, why pin yourself down? Let us say sometime or a couple of years, but don't do yourself a bad service by putting on such obstacles, end quote. Tuhami ended his words saying that Sadat had, to, had deep feelings of confidence in Begin and Dayan, and would be prepared to deal with them as opposed to the members of the previous Israeli labor coalition government. At a certain point in the meeting, Tohami said in no uncertain terms that Sadat will not agree to shake Begin's hand as long as a single Israeli soldier is stationed on Arab soil. But then he corrected himself, he retracted, and he said, referring to Egyptian soil. 
King Hassan attempted to soften the conditions, the condition, this condition put forth, saying that, I quote, Sadat would surely agree to meet Begin if the latter will promise him that in principle, Israel favors the return of the occupied territories, meaning all occupied territories. Foreign Minister Laraki, who also thought that Tohami overstepped his bounds and said this much in the meeting. In fact, he told them basically, if I were to tra translate what he said in the document, shut up. Tohami had no choice but to go along with the king's suggestion. He don't say no to Laraki and he definitely don't say no to the to Hassan. In the meeting, Dayan explained to his interlocutors that he was merely Begin's envoy and could not make decisions and promises without prior consultations with the prime minister. He stressed that even an Israeli prime minister could not offer commit, uh, commitments on his own without bringing it before the government and the Knesset. In other words, Israel is a democracy, okay? Should Begin undertake such a step, he also said, there would be no possibility of keeping our meetings secret. My interpretation, Dayan seemed concerned about the apparent Egyptian, Egyptian assistance that Israel accept the principle of territorial evacuation of all Arab territories as a precondition for further advancing the talks. At the time, but also well into the meetings with the Egyptian negotia negotiators after Sadat's dramatic visit to Jerusalem in November 1977, Israel continued to adhere to a separate settlement with Egypt, mainly to remove the threat of a major Arab country in entering a major Arab war coalition against it. Without Egypt joining or leading a war coalition, large scale and total wars could not be launched. For that, Israel was considering withdrawing for most of the Sinai. Begin and Dayan did not rule out major withdrawal from the Golan Heights either. In return for security arrangements and guarantees by the Assad regime, the Jewish settlements there would continue to exist and flourish under Syrian sovereignty. Yet, as noted, Begin and Sadat considered an Israeli-Syrian deal as premature, gambling that Sadat would not join Egypt in a peace process. Besides, Israel was no hurry to reach an agreement with Damascus. Simultaneously, Israel sought to preserve, even tighten the grip on the rest of the occupied territories, essentially the West Bank, Judea and Samaria in Begin's terminology, and Gaza. He never called it the Gaza Strip. In English, he always referred to it as Gaza. No. No, as in Hebrew, we call it Hevel Gaza, not Gaza Strip, okay? Lo Retsuat Aza, as they say, okay. Refusing to hand these over to either the PLO, which in Begin's view could well become a pro-Soviet sovereign Palestinian client state, or to Jordanian domination and supervision. This policy on the Begin ran contrary to the previous labor government in Israel's Jordanian option that called for territorial compromise in the West Bank and Gaza in favor of some type of a Palestinian entity, not a state, and certainly not a state by the PLO, but a certain type of a Palestinian entity in association with the Kingdom of Jordan. This is the Opsia Yardenit, what they call, short of a Palestinian state, et cetera. As, as for begging, however, the most he could tolerate was administrative autonomy and self-rule over Arab populations, i.e. Palestinian Arabs. By the way, he never used the term Palestinian people because the minute you say Palestinian people, you, you are moving to an area we can say there is an identity here, a group, and that they can also not only have their legitimate rights, okay, um, they, can, um, they can actually say we, uh, we have the right to uh, forge our own future. So use the term Palestinian Arabs, whereby Israel would continue to, and what he said with this autonomy, Israel would continue to maintain control over the land and the Jewish settlements would not merely remain intact, but in fact, intact, but in fact would continue to expand. Eventually perhaps, okay, but 
eventually perhaps leading to Israel's sovereignty over Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. Till this day, it hasn't been done, but Begin kept that option in place. Thus, there was a conceptual gap between Sadat's position over a comprehensive peace settlement that included generous territorial concessions on Israel's part, and Begin's position that Jordan would not be an association with some type of Palestinian entity. The September 16 uh, meeting ended with numerous questions, question marks hovering from above. But there was the will to continue the deliberations. Diane expressed cautious optimism and suggested that a meeting between Begin and Sadat would also be arranged uh, to help jumpstart the whole process. Tohami seemed overjoyed to the extreme, I would say, and was absolutely certain that Jordan and Syria would join the process. He later reported to Sadat, at least insofar as Egypt was concerned, he felt Israel would withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula. Although again, Dayan could not and did not commit himself a priori to any, to any major Sinai withdrawal, though he apparently did not rule it out either. Dayan now planned to head for Washington. However, at the end of the deliberation, it was decided at the deliberation that Dayan would leave forthwith to Israel to report to Begin on the conditions raised by Egypt. Tohami pushed for another working meeting between him and Dayan, and the latter suggested that such a meeting to be held in Morocco should take place sometime around 27, 28, 29 September, to be followed after this by uh, uh, to be followed after his return, Diane's return from Washington. And Hassan also said, it would be nice, we, I may arrange for a meeting in Morocco between Begin and Sadat. It never materialized, never transpired. A second uh, meeting did not uh, materialize immediately. However, within a short time, news of the six, uh, September 16 meeting, not all the details, but that there was a meeting, leaked to the Israeli and international press, but not necessarily by the Israelis who are known as leakers. Give me five, please. No, I, I, look, I, I put a lot of effort into this and I'm, I'm, I'm drawing to an end. Um, the Moroccans were furious, but, and they blamed the Israelis. The person who apparently leaked, it out, leaked the information was Tohami. They informed them that the publicity, it informed the Israelis caused much unhappiness among the Egyptians. Any plans about Egyptian-Israeli working sessions for the immediate future were thus scrapped. scrapped. Within two months, Sadat surprised the world when he landed in Israel on November 19th and gave his landmark speech at the Knesset the following day. Plans were underway for entering into substantive negotiations. In my book, Israel and the Maghreb, Israel and the Maghreb, from Statehood to Oslo that was published in 2004, I stated that I could not assess with certainty uh, the magnitude of Hassan's contribution to the Camp David Accords of September 17, 1978, brokered by the US President Jimmy Carter, or the March 26, 1979 peace treaty itself signed in Washington. But whether or not the Moroccan contribution in 1977 and the intercession to the much bigger achievements in the latter half of 1978 and throughout 1979 was relatively marginal, if it was, is a moot point. Yet the meeting of minds in Rabat between a high Israeli official and an Egyptian counterpart and through Hassan's mediation, all this doubtless clarified matters over whether both sides were psychologically mature enough to pursue negotiations on their own or through a subsequent American mediation by the Carter administration. I'll go one more page and stop. Sadat did not uh, want a peace conference in Geneva, sponsored by both the US and Soviet Union. He hated the Russians, not like Nasser, he hated them, especially after the Americans and Soviets released a major statement on October 1st, 1977 only two weeks after Dayan, the Dayan Tohami meeting in Morocco. And they called for conven con convening the conference by the end of 1977 under their sponsorship, US Soviet sponsorship. Sadat despised the Soviets. True, back in 1971, he signed the friendship agreement 
with the, with the Kremlin. But he did so because he had began to play the initial plans for war against Israel that occurred, as we all know, in October 1973, due to the stalemate in the peace efforts that he attempted to promote in February of that year. To accomplish the goals of war, Sadat badly needed sophisticated weaponry from the Soviets and diplomatic support from the Kremlin. At the time, Egypt's relations with Washington were strained from the time of the June 1967 war. He was still dependent on the Kremlin, a dependence that developed under Nasser, but he planned to be rid of the Soviets at the opportune moment in favor of improved relations with the United States. It was after the October war and the signing of the Sinai I and Sinai II disengagement agreements that in 1976, he finally ended the friendship agreement long before the agreement was set to expire. It was set to expire in 1986. He feared that the Carter administration, Sadat, will, uh, uh, will team up with the Soviets and some of the other elements in the Geneva negotiations should these take place, you know, uh, to weaken Egypt's position in the Arab world and make him politically vulnerable. Sadat preferred to go with Begin and Dayan and skip, skip Geneva. Morocco was a good option. This is the punchline here. And though he advocated tenaciously the need for a compromise, peace settlement, a comprehensive peace settlement to include all countries involved in the Arab-Israeli conflict, and for a solution to the Palestinian problem, Sadat also became weary of the PLO, the Assad regime, and did not wish to confront them in Geneva. He now preferred closer ties with King Hussein of Jordan, and of course, negotiation with Israel. Begging equally ambivalent to such a joint American-Soviet initiative, not wanting to be in the same boat in Geneva in a hostile atmosphere with the Russians, Syrians, and Palestinians represented in an all Arab delegation, the Palestinians, in an all Arab delegation or in a Jordanian delegation. It appears to me that in this sense, the Moroccan back channel proved to its usefulness in putting Geneva on the back burner. In late 1977 or early 1978, Begin and Sadat embarked on the path of aligning himself with the United States, leaving out the Soviets. But there was a more, but there was more. Despite the temporary freezing of the Moroccan connection of the leaks in the press, another meeting arranged with the assistance of Mossad took place this time in Marrakesh, in the king's presence, uh, in, his, in, his, in, the, in the palace compound. I will end this by saying that a lot of more substantive issues came up even about what can be done with the serious policing, uh, demilitarized zones, could there be in the Sinai uh, Jewish settlements, after Israel withdrawal and everything goes, goes back under renewed Egyptian sovereignship. All of this was, uh, um, was true. The one statement from that second document, the Mossad from Dece the meeting of December 2nd and 3rd, 1977, is something as a, a, a King Hussein said, and with this I will end. Uh, it's actually what Dayan said. Dayan was still skeptical about Jordan and Syria joining. He was right, saying that King Hussein, and I quote him, is afraid to get his fingers wet and thus will not make a, more, uh, a move without Assad, end quote. Dayan also said emphatically, I will not meet the PLO representatives. They are murderers, I quote him. Let that be made clear. This time, Hassan and his entourage left to Hami and Diane alone to carry direct negotiations between them. This is the first time this has been going on. And then he came back and he said, you're not making any progress, he told to Hami and, uh, and Diane. And, and this, I will end in 30 seconds. The king came in and interceded, warning that lack of progress would place moderate Arab states in danger vis-a-vis -vis Arab radical states. Hassan also suggested that should Syria decide to stay out, Egypt and Jordan would play, uh, play it along, which means he finally gave up on Assad being the great leader that you can do everything. And then he says, the PLO is a cancer in our midst. I do not care about its fate. The two of you should overcome your petty differences, such as over Sharm al-Sheikh. We must have some results. I will end here and even though I had another couple of pages, but I will end here. Thank you very much.